Yeah, man. Always, a, always a pleasure. I love it. I always love the origin stories. Andy starting off at a recruiter desk, owner of a staffing company, tech startup. I, I love it, man. So much, uh, so many similarities between the two of us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Love it. <laughs> well, the Adam story. Uh, well, Adam Conrad, founder of CXO of Great Recruiters. Um, much like yourself, I've been in the industry for about, I think I'm hitting 25 years uh, here real soon. Um, you know, much like everybody, you know, I fell into I fell into recruiting, really didn't know what it was about. Um, I actually was a technical reference from a coworker of mine and the recruiter spun it into a interview and a sales pitch on why I should be a recruiter. And the rest is kind of history. But, um, you know, I grew up uh, really cutting my teeth in the IT engineering staffing world, uh, moved into recruiting management, uh, really uh, ended my career in staffing, um, really in, in an operations role, heavily involved in technology implementations uh, and integration, early adopter of a lot of stuff. So I've always really liked the marriage between, you know, people and technology. And, you know, for me, I started Great Recruiters uh, much about, you know, what this conversation is about today is um, I realized the industry and recruiters were not up against the competition of the person next to them, but really the reputation of the industry. And I wanted to do something about it. Um, people work with people and recruiters are the feet on the street. They're the face of every staffing organization. They talk to more people than anybody else and really wanted to provide a way for them to be able to showcase their skills and experience and, and the type of experiences candidates can, um, can expect when working with them and, and, you know, ensuring that high quality of, uh, of candidate experience. So, Really, that's uh, what brought me into doing this is uh, really wanted to help this industry improve that reputation by providing more transparency of what candidates think about working with recruiters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, from from a product standpoint, I mean, one of the things that we hear all the time is, you know, recruiters are increasing their callbacks because as they're sharing what, you know, industry peers think about working with them, there's this level of, of trust that's established through transparency, through reviews. I mean, it's how we make decisions in our daily lives and it's how job seekers are making decisions on what recruiters to work with. But I'm with you. I, I, you know, you might only be able to help maybe three to five percent of the people you talk to, uh, but you have an opportunity to create value for a hundred percent of them. That's a choice, right? That is that is an individual choice of what kind of value and and like you said, what kind of experience do you want to leave? What kind of impression do you want to leave with that candidate? And you know, that just comes down to I think having a good conversation and um, putting their agenda ahead of your own, uh, but. Some of my best referral sources, Andy, that were people I never placed. They're they're people I help. They're they're people that knew that if they were to refer somebody to me, they were going to get the same kind of treatment and and same kind of attention as they did. And you know, everyone's looking for a great recruiter to work with. Right.
Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about the opportunity you have as a recruiter, and I wish I learned this early in my career, every candidate that calls you back is a gift, right? It might not be a gift that you get to open the day, but somewhere down the line, you just don't know where that opportunity is. And so if you're very short-sighted and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of firms train this way, call the next one, call the next one, hammer the calls. Um, there's very little value in those conversations and it becomes high transaction. If a company is going to work with a staffing firm, the reason they're working with a staffing firm is because that firm should be able to access and provide talent the company otherwise can't get themselves. If they can get it themselves, there's no sense in partnering with a recruitment firm. Uh, but the value of a staffing firm is their individual recruiter's ability to tap into a network, not to pre-screen a bunch of job applicants and not that there's not great people that are job applicants, but companies can do that as well. The, the, the goal is to get deeper into that talent pool. And the only way you do that is through building relationships, building trust, getting referrals, um, and, and really continuing to add value. That's the only way you get that deeper talent pool. And, and that's where we see recruiters who are top rated. We ask, you know, what's your number one, two source of hire? And they're like, well, it's great recruiters and it's referrals, right? It's their network. It's their brand. And candidates are following recruiters. They're not following a staffing company. You know, nobody out there from a candidate perspective is like, I'm following the staff. And they're like, I'm following Andy no matter where he goes because Andy's where my trust is. No. Yep. I always say this, if you create a poor experience, they'll remember your company name and it's your company's fault. If you create a great experience, they're gonna remember you. So every time a recruiter is on the phone, your your brand is on the line. And I think that's what some staffing firms and leadership don't recognize. Like that is critical, right? That your your brand is on the line every time somebody in your organization picks up the phone and talks to a candidate, it's, it's your brand. Your brand is not what your website says anymore. It's, it's what other people say about you. It's what your online reputation is. It's, it's the success or failures that you have with your people. You know, I think we measure the wrong things um, in this industry. I think this industry is a little behind the times. They're not looking at the recruiters as marketers. And so it's to me, it's not about 100 dials. And that's a good target to have. Make 100 phone calls. That's great. What's the quality of those conversations? What's the callback rate? And I think callback rate is probably one of the biggest leading indicators of the health of a recruiter is their ability to get people to call them back. Um, if you're just dialing and dialing and dialing and you're not measuring the efficiency of those calls, I think you're missing a huge opportunity at the top of the funnel to give your recruiters the skills and ability and tools like great recruiters to help them get more callbacks because it doesn't matter how many dials you make, it doesn't matter how many candidates you have in your database, if they don't trust you and they don't call you back, you're, you're left with nothing. You might as well have no database at all. Right. No, and I, I think providing that any information you can to increase the callback is important. And, and, and you would ask, like, are these conversations that are happening at an industry level? Um, I don't think they're happening at a mainstream level that they will be. I, I'm, I'm predicting in the next year or two, we're going to hear a lot more about the importance of recruiter reputation, uh, because really that is your that is your brand. And, you know, a lot of companies are always focused on, you know, 
making more placements. And to me, placements are the result of everything else you do. You know, making that the center point of everything you do, I think, makes it a lot more transactional. And and that's why when I had a recruit, it's like add value every day. The more value you add, the deeper your talent pool is going to be, the higher likelihood you are going to have of success. And as a recruiter that's been doing this for two, three years, if they're still churning and burning through urgent job seekers and they don't have a talent pool that they're tapping into, there's really a big loss there of opportunity uh, in my mind. And, you know, Smittel interview ratios, they're important, uh, but they kind of tell you what the past is right? They, they tell you about past performance. Um, they don't tell you why you're getting stuck. Why are you getting the submittals and not getting the interviews? Why are you getting the interviews and not getting the hires? And a lot of times that's distilled down to the quality of conversation and relationship that recruiter has with a candidate. And if those things that are um, the, the, the Smittle interviews and the hires are the outcomes of that, they're, they're not what is really what matters, which is the quality of that conversation you're having and are you doing a good job aligning that candidate to the right opportunities? Are you listening? Because the truth always comes out. You know this, Andy. If you don't ask the tough questions up front, and, and not in a, in a tough way, but if you don't ask those tough questions up front, the, the real answers are going to come out at, at the end of the day. When the, when, the, when, the, when the offer is made, the truth will come out. <laughs> and if you've done a really good job, what's that? No, no, because those tough conversations, they're, they're there. They're going to happen. It's just a matter of when they happen. If they're happening at the offer, then you have less time and opportunity to really kind of backtrack and try to figure out why it's happening then. And so um, making sure that you have uh, good alignment, good transparency, you're not trying to pull any punches because that all of the truth from a candidate's perspective is going to come out. And if you're not peeling back that onion in your conversations, you're missing a ton of opportunity. Um, and I think candidates appreciate that. Um, you said they're getting hammered and bombarded. And I I have a different perspective is, is candidates are easy to find. You can find any type of candidate you want. The question is whether or not they'll call you back. Do you have an opportunity that's going to align with them today? And you can't figure that out if, if you can't have the conversation. So with all of the tools and technology, there is no shortage of the ability to find candidates. It's whether or not they have a good reason to want to talk to you. Yeah. Well, I think this industry is always has has its ebbs and flows, right? We went through 2008, through the downturn. Um, sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees. Um, you know, you're either you're either going into a storm, you're in the storm, or you're coming out of it. And right now, I just think for a lot of people, we're in the storm. Um, with that, I've talked to a number of companies that are continuing to have success. I mean, maybe not at the level of success they had when things were just like shooting fish in a barrel, but placements are being made. Uh, companies are spending money. Companies are hiring. And the question is, are they hiring them from you? Are they hiring them from the competition? So um, where we're at right now, it, it is tough. It is tough for a lot of companies out there. But I also think these downturns are what kind of um, trims the fat. Uh, and I think this industry got pretty fat during COVID. Um, you know, we do a lot within healthcare, and I think there was a lot of hiring, a lot of growth, a lot of everything, and it was not sustainable. Uh, and so I think those companies that had strong foundational operations uh, were smart with their cash flow. They're coming out and they're able to sustain these tougher times uh, where others just aren't. They were very opportunistic. And when things get tough, uh, if you can't survive, then, you know, is the business model the right model for you? Or were you focused on the right thing? And so for me, today is the time to really make sure that the foundation of your house is solid. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can, you find wins in different ways. Maybe it's not the number of placements. Maybe it's the, 
number of referrals you're getting. Maybe it's the deeper relationships they're having. There are inches everywhere. Uh, it's just a matter of, are you focused on finding those inches or are you focused on weathering the storm and just hoping to get out of it alive? And for me, I'd rather try to find ways to thrive in tough times than just survive. Um, and I think a lot of that is focused on your internal operations um, and making sure that you're doing all the right things, that you should be a provider of choice. And if you're not, it's a great time to figure that out. You know, I, I think we're in a really interesting time. Like, so automation really caught, you know, the last five years, right? Automation was everything. And so if you're not figuring out how to leverage automation today, you're kind of behind and it's not too late um, because there's a lot of people that implemented automation technology early on. And I think um, they still just have a birthday and anniversary card going out. So um, for me, <laughs> you you got to use it. Um, I'm really interested in, in anything that's helping to strengthen that relationship, enhance that relationship between the, the candidates and recruiters. Um, I think easy ways of helping candidates be able to self-select, provide um, their interest. Uh, you know, I think there's some good stuff happening with some chat and some AI. I know I've experienced some of it where, you know, you're having a conversation, you feel like you're having that conversation and it's, it's not with a person, but it's a, there's a lot of value because you can get a lot of information and you can provide a lot of information without a lot of friction. Um, I think it's still a little early on the AI side. I, I feel like we're, we continuously, fall into this trap where we're trying to automate the recruiter. We're trying to uh, take what a great recruiter does and try to duplicate it through technology. And you just can't automate the human experience. And I think as job seekers, there's still, a, a I would say, a majority that want to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, peace of mind that they have a human being on the other end of the line. Um, and they're not just talking to a robot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm watching live baseball games as a, as a, as a baseball coach to my kid and, uh, a young soccer player with my daughter and my older son in, in, in high school baseball. I, I'm, I'm on some sort of field with grass uh, outside. So there's, it doesn't leave much time for, uh, for shows. Although I, I finally did finish up Breaking Bad after many, many, many years and tries. Uh, that's the last thing I streamed. I can't, I, I get, it's tough for me to invest that time uh, unless it's a completed series that's highly rated. So I'm going to find my next completed highly rated series. So I'm not left in the lurch halfway through, uh, you know, a season and they decide to cut it. <laughs> so any suggestions I'm open for it, Andy. Too late for that. Too late for that. <laughs> I love it. I appreciate it as well. Thanks so much for your time, Andy.